I, I host a bunch of shows, including Sword and Laser. Um, thank you, uh, Texilla and Factor Fictional over on Revision 3. And I am super excited to be here for this panel today. Um, I play one on TV. <laughs> and I'm joined by the fantastic Mr. Adam Savage of Mythbusters. And my dear, dear, wonderful friend, Mr. Phil Plate, the baddest part. I've got a lot of questions from the internet to kind of kick things off, and, uh, and then afterwards... The internet has questions? Internet, yes. It's actually John Internet. <laughs> Very vocal person. John P. Internet. He's such a troll. Um, but we have, and then we'll leave about a half an hour at the end for questions as well. So I don't know if... Uh, I'll keep an eye on the clock, but if someone from the crew here could give me maybe a 30 minutes heads up. Why are you pointing at the... Why are you waving? Oh, he's waving at someone else. I thought he was pointing. Hey. <laughs> hey. Like, well, yeah, nice to see you. Thing. Sorry. So first of all, how are, you, are you guys having a good Dragon Con so far? Well, I arrived at 6 o'clock this morning. <gasps> you took a nap I, before the show. I have taken a couple of naps. Yeah, we were, we were, filming, um, we were filming Mythbusters. Woo. We were killing plants yesterday afternoon in San Francisco. Oh. Just one arugula plant. Calm down. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't pee in it or anything. Is this something for, for an upcoming episode? On we what, we did. The topic? There's, we're doing an episode, a lovely episode called Do Try This at Home. Ooh. Ooh. Where finally we are uh, doing some stuff that you can actually try, um, and it's straight. You are very uh, wow. Hobby. I'm very uh, plosive today. Plosive, plosive, fiddling, fiddling. We are, and it's kicking our butt to do try this at home episode because this stuff is tends to be semi innocuous and without a big explosive finish, we're kind of at a loss. Well, that's, that was actually a question that we were going to have for later, but I guess I'll get to it right now. Um, although then I'd have to scroll through to find the actual question. But in the beginning of the show, you have a disclaimer like, do not try this stuff at home. Um, so were you getting a lot of pushback about that? Did people actually want to try things at home? Well, luckily. Luckily, no one has really tried any of our dangerous stuff at home. Um, we get a lot of questions from science teachers who use Mythbusters as a weekly lesson in how, to, how not to do science. <laughs> <laughs> and um, we get, it's a constant request, please put some stuff on the air that I can actually try with my kids without EMTs and protective gear. Um, so we took that seriously and we have, I mean, we were able to actually pick and choose between about 30 different fun things. Um, the one that's really kicking our ass right now is the frickin' metronomes. Metronomes. There's an internet video of the metronomes syncing up. It's it's a real ass kicker. I don't know why. <laughs> it's the little things, right? Yeah, it is. The it's ones a, you wouldn't expect. It turns out that the most difficult thing for us, and you'll laugh at this, is we'll think, oh, that's really easy. We've seen how that happens. We know how it works. So we'll shoot it. And then when we get the result that we know we'll get, we'll move on. We never get the result that we were planning on. And so whenever we paint ourselves into a narrative corner by expecting a result from an experiment, we get screwed. Now, now Phil, do you feel as though the Mythbusters follow the appropriate scientific method in testing their experiences? Well, I've never seen the show, so I... Uh, and actually, uh, what you said is interesting. You said nobody, you know, nobody's ever complained or anything, or nobody's ever tried it at home. You don't know. I mean, they simply have not survived. Unless they, they, they sue you. And said, yeah, you know. The video, uh, of the, the video hasn't shown up on YouTube yet. Yeah, when all their fingers are blown off, they can't type on the keyboard. Um, and I'm, now I'm thinking about the metronome. I mean, that's the one where you have like seven metronomes and they all start swinging. Yeah. And, but they have to be isolated, right? Like you could hang them like on a plank or something from the ceiling? I don't want to give away too uh, much. Right, right, right. I'm, just, I'm just thinking, because I've seen that video, it's actually it's really cool. It but, is really cool. But they don't tell you how long it takes them to sync up, do they, in that video? No, they don't. Yeah, it could be, you know, like thousands of years. This is an experiment started by Pythagoras, and now, yeah. Are you going to do a pitch drop myth? Yeah, that's what I was thinking, too. Yeah, it's like pitch five drop. people laughed at that. Yeah, thank you. Well, that was in the news this week. Yeah. Awesome. What, 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 the pitch drop is a, it's an experiment that's been going on oh, right, 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 for 60 yes, yes, years, yes, yes. I think. It's a really oh, this experiment. They finally saw one of the drops. It was not the original pitch drop, but it yeah. was a pitch drop happened. Right. And uh, they got it on camera for the first time. 
big deal, you guys. This is a really yeah. big deal. But then we just dumped 800 memory cards. Yeah. Yeah. But then the guy who originated or, or, or did this just died before the original pitch drop. Oh. It was actually ever dry. I, don't, I, I read about it and I haven't had a chance to look His at it. His soul it's a, is in the drop. Right. It's, like, it's like Moses not seeing the promised land. You know, have your whole life on one experiment that you can just look at. Nothing ever happens. And then you die. And... <laughs> Um, as far as scientific protocol goes, um, I mean, Adam's talked about this before. It's you're not doing scientific research; you're doing sort of a scientific idea. Well, we don't stand by our results, but we try and stand by our methodology. Yeah, exactly. We try and construct a robust, a robust methodology that, if we had more time, we would actually come up with some genuine data. Yeah, and I think I think that's true. And it's uh, it's not so much. You're working in a lab under controlled conditions. Uh, um, but it is, it is science, right? There's a question, you have an answer, you, you, you kind of think, well, maybe it'll do this. And then you try to figure out what will happen and you control for it a little bit. And the thing um, we argue about the most, Jamie and I, and our crew, is which variables to remove and which right. are throwing it off. Like, we really do argue constantly, I don't think that's important, I totally think that's important, and try and figure out the best way to come up with a, a genuinely neutral result. Right, and of course there are time pressures and TV pressures. Yeah. So it's not, you've gotta be able to, you've got all these different things, plus it's gotta play well on TV, so that's gotta be a, a nice little extra added pressure. Well, that's, it is. that's kind of what this whole panel is about, is science on television and how is it different from, you know, science you would actually conduct in a laboratory. Um, so what are the biggest challenges you guys think are faced by people trying to either prove or disprove things in the TV space? <laughs> time. Time? It's all time. I mean, there, I don't think there's much of a difference on an average, well-constructed experiment that we do on television and a genuine published paper as an experiment, except that um, the amount of time it takes to really write out what your methodology is, why you're using it, every piece of it. Um, the, when you go and read a scientific paper, the degree, it's almost exhausting to read because they're going yeah. into every last period and every, you know, we use this type of ink because of this. Um, we're not doing any of that stuff. Uh, but I do think that for a working scientist, we are showing that the process is exciting and yeah. creative. And that's the thing for me that I, you know, we're not trying to do science on television. We're trying to demonstrate that science is creative and fun. Fun, yeah. So you feel like it's more of an outreach thing than anything else? Absolutely. Yeah, I'd say so. Um, it, it is, well, I mean, you've said this many times on other panels that if you had set out to do a TV show, you know, doing science, it right. probably wouldn't work that way. You wanted to do something that was fun and then there was science in it. And the, the hard part is, well, so there's two things. I mean, one is that, and you've had this, some experience with this, it's difficult to tell a story for television that also is a genuinely scientific story. And by that I mean that each part of it leads naturally to the next one. Because the scientific method is that, right? I do an experiment <laughs> and I based... Yeah, it's just like that. <laughs> so, yeah, we've solved this one, let's move on to the next part. Yeah. Well, but each experiment that you do is led from the failures of, the, of right. its predecessor yeah. or the data that you got yeah, to, no, to get true. to the next one. Yeah. So to me, I think the scientific method and the narrative arc dovetail nicely when you're committed to the scientific method. Um, I have run into television producers in the past who aren't so rigorous about the scientific method. Part. Really? And <laughs> do it say? Well, actually, the, the part the part that I would say is most scientific about MythBusters is when you revisit old myths because people have said, yeah. "What about this?" And it turns out, oh, that might be important if you know we didn't we didn't test it that way. And so why don't we why don't we check and see if our results still hold? Yeah. Um, and then you do the rocket car like five different times and smash three it times, six hundred miles times. an hour into the steel plate. Woo! <laughs> um, you can that, keep doing it. I will keep watching. I know. That, the, the two the two stage one from, from a couple of years ago was still not like the best footage besides you being slapped out. in slow motion. Um, <laughs> the the rocket car smashing into the into the wall. With the oh, two stages, right, because right, right. you see it hit, and then the, second, then the first stage comes in, and it's like there's like all kinds of stuff going on in that 15 seconds. Plus, 600 mile an hour rocket car. Come on, hello. I have. It was astonishing to watch something accelerate to the speed of sound from there to there. Yeah, <laughs> I've never seen it before. I will tell you that it is one of the things that I thought Man of Steel got right. Oh. Like when you got to see Superman like, moving, I swear that's exactly what it felt like when I watched that car do that. <laughs> So we have a question from Twitter from Richard Betts. He wants to know, how can we give TV audiences more insight into how science is carried out rather than just the findings? 
I think you guys actually do a pretty good job of that. We try that. You know, there's a show I've always wanted to do, and I'm not sure if the current state of television will support it. That's Oprah, I assume? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, one of the things about when you meet working scientists is they're rarely, they're rarely addicted to the single discipline that they're in. They almost universally have hobbies. I found this all over NASA, JPL, Sandia. These guys, they go home and they collect butterflies or they modify their car, but they do it at the highest level that it's being done by hobbyists. And that says something to me about a scientist is that they have really, really hungry brains. And again, I think that we were raised in a generation that science was guys in white lab coats. And that's exactly what I expected. You know, and, and we just thought, well, science is this building full of knowledge, and it's not. It's this. It's a mountain to be stormed. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, I, I agree. I mean, my my role models when I was a kid were, you know, Will Robinson on Lost in Space, right? Oh, yeah. a little redheaded science dork. Okay, I can probably <laughs> identify with that kid. Um, and you know, Spock and and Victor Bergman from Space 1999. Really? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Phil, it turns out we're old. Yeah, everybody here is under the age of 30, apparently. I used to get up every awesome. morning at 6 a.m. to watch Mr. Wizard. Right. Sorry for setting you on fire last week, Billy. Yeah. Um, and, and I think you're right. I remember thinking about that when I was in, when I was in grad school, and, and I've, uh, all the grad students I was working with were mountain climbers, uh, uh, pilots, skydivers. Uh, one guy was like a professional ski instructor. And everything, like you said, everything they did, it was like just top flight. And, uh, and then there was, it was just me. You know? <laughs> I'm gonna watch all of Star Trek all in a row. So I guess I guess I, I count. There's serial. Of itself, yeah. we, I think we are in serial enthusiasts. Is what I like to call myself. Okay. <laughs> um, except not all. Not not. Serial implies one at a time. Oh no, it's not one at a yeah, time. Yeah, it's not one at a time. Covalent enthusiasm? Covalent. <laughs> I think that's kind of what a geek is, though. I think that's kind of what we all are. Is we yeah. become, when we get obsessed with something, we take it to that extreme level where we have to know all of the things. You know, it's, it's funny because I'll find myself, we just had a summer break that was longer than I've had in a long time. And I ended up getting to spend really almost two full weeks in my cave just working. And there were several days where I actually almost panicked because I walk in and I was like, what shall we work on today? And then I'd be like, I can't decide. And then so you just maybe. Went and took a nap. You, oh, no, I played, I, I played Millipede until something occurred to me. <laughs> we're going to feature my Millipede, my Millipede console on, the, on Tested soon because oh, right it's absolutely one of my and breaths that I fans. take at the shop. <laughs> Norm is right there, if you guys I, can see him. I got Norm. the card. Yeah, Norm, Norman Chan from Tested's over there. I got the card that converts Millipede to Centipede, so you can play both on the same Just arcade divide game. by ten, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's why the metric system is better. That, that's my favorite joke of the day. I, I feel better for making up for trying to kill you here when you came on stage. So it's, uh, <laughs> it certainly feels ten times easier. Yeah, really? Mil centipede? Absolutely. <laughs> I never played millipede. Mil well, millipede, millipede's just like centipede, only 10 times better. <laughs> <laughs> He's back on track. Uh, yeah, this, uh, one, sadly, yeah. this one is uh, Science Not Scary wants to ask Phil, uh, which show makes your degree hurt the most? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get this sort of sciatica feeling when I'm watching TV. It sometimes. tilts on the wall and goes boop. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, God, the whole TV just, yeah. And all the electrons spill out on the corner of the TV. <laughs> Which one? Um, well, anything on the History Channel. Yeah. Uh, this isn't. Uh, nobody's, nobody's recording this, right? Um, wait, which one are you on? Okay, no, I, it's, no, it's I, Discovery. I know. As a, as a, um, <laughs> yeah, I'm going to tell the story. So, <laughs> I was recently at a thing. I was recently at a thing. That's a, a specific thing. Okay. I'll get, and I'm sitting next to a lovely person. And I say, what do you do? And they say, I am a host of a ghost hunting show on a non-discovery network. Right. And, and, which doesn't narrow it down at all because they all have a freaking right. ghost yeah, hunting do. show. Yeah. But it's not a discovery network. So she says, I'm, a, I'm one of the hosts of a ghost hunting show. And I, and I just stand there like this with my brain going, what do you do? What do you say? 
And during that pause, she goes, you know, just like you. Oh. <laughs> and I just kept this smile I, I missed, on my face. I missed the ghost hunting episode of Mythbusters. <laughs> I, I did not see oh, that. that would be you will awesome. continue to miss the ghost hunting episode. <laughs> Actually, I will tell you that Guillermo del Toro has pitched me a ghost hunting episode of Mythbusters. That's brilliant. Oh, no, I will watch that. It, it would be worth watching, even though it's way outside of our mission statement. Yeah. It's, it's just Jamie going, did you hear that? <laughs> I, I must ask you if you heard that. There, there are actually ghosts stuck in there. <laughs> and that's not the worst of it. <laughs> the tormented soul. Okay, moving on. Okay. <laughs> I saw the pursed lips on Veronica. Oh, okay, let's. <laughs> Just laughing on the inside. On the inside. Yeah. Uh, Ruben Clamzo wants to know: uh, Will you ever do any astronomical myths? And, yeah, hello. Uh, you know, with a well-known astronomy communicator. <laughs> well, I have my name's on the credit of one episode of the Moon Hoax Show. Phil was our consigliere for the Moon Hoax. Yeah. 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 Basically, basically that's when uh, Alice Stallo and she was. Producer? Yeah, Alice was our producer, producer for most of the ten years. Most of the last ten years, she she right. left the show about a year and a half, two years ago. And and you guys had contacted me, and you wanted to know how reflective the moon was, what its albedo is, how much light it reflects. So albedo, libido, albedo, the libido, the libido, moon. albedo, albedo, I mean, albino, yeah. albedo. Actually, all these words are, are actually a little related. Albino, albedo. I'm, I'm willing to accept that as an answer. So the moon um, libido episode is a, for a different show. Yeah, the libido. <laughs> we actually just finished the law, the rules of attraction, MythBusters. Yeah. Did they lock you and Jamie in a room? And no. <laughs> because that'll make some fans now, very please. happy. I, I read one paragraph of Mythbusters slash <laughs> Big <laughs> It is truly impossible to unthink something. <laughs> okay. I hope I I've been looking up unicorns ever since. <laughs> I hope I used a pseudonym on that one. Uh, I mean, like, a herd of unicorn chasers after that. <laughs> what I imagined was some two guys at the NSA go, oh, look what he's reading. This will be good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, back to the topic, because why the hell not? Um, uh, yeah, so, so that's, that's really all she wanted to know, was how reflective is the moon? So 100% reflective, zero, you know, you can see it, so it's reflecting some of the light from the sun. And I just remember that phone call because I said, well, it's actually a little bit complicated. There, there are different parts of the moon, and when you look at the moon, there's the, the bright parts, that's where the, most of the craters are, and that's more reflective than the dark parts, obviously, which look like oceans on the moon, and they're actually called maria, which is Latin for sea. And, uh, and I said, well, you know, so it's 7%, 20%, and I can hear, like, Alice's blood pressure rising on the phone. And she's like, well, which is it? And I said, well, you know, and as it depends. And, and finally she just said, give me an average. I mean, it was just like that. I'm, I'm laughing at her. And I said, yeah, 12%. She's like, all right, good. And so that was sort of my contribution to that particular show. Alice was brilliant at, at boiling things down yeah, to yeah, their yeah. essence. And she would take an argument from me and Jamie, and we'd be arguing we would argue, start arguing about one thing and then move on to another and start to, and she'd just be like, what is the question? Yeah, yeah. And she'd bring you on back. And, and Alice uh, stood out early on in Mythbusters. She started out as a researcher. And we, in the first season, we did Mythanic. Uh, will you get sucked down by a sinking boat? And it turns out in San Francisco Bay, there is no permit you can get for sinking a boat in San Francisco Bay. It's just not possible. And you're not allowed to set out to sink a boat. They will. It's possible. Yes. Yes, right. It is true. <laughs> Forgiveness instead of permission. Yeah. But we were trying to do things on the up and up, and they, we couldn't get permission. And then Alice came up with, she, she was like talking to the permitting department. She goes, OK, look, I don't want to sink a boat. I want to temporarily submerge a boat. <laughs> And they were like, oh, well, that's okay. <laughs> it's all the wording. It's yeah. all the wording. Yeah, she's pretty cool. <laughs> so one of my favorite things to do personally is, like, you know, look at the science and tech and pop culture. It's, it's, and, and I know both of you guys have done a lot in that area, of course. But is there anything you've seen, I don't know, recently or, or in the recent past that you've just been like, that is so wrong? 
Like something Pacific that just made your, get your hat off. <laughs> Yeah, I had. I had, uh, oh, you I, just mean the physics of yeah, giant machines. I, I, I saw Pacific Rim, and all I tweeted was, "I, I may have a bit of an issue with the phys with the material science of, of Pacific yeah. Rim," and that got a lot of retweets from people. Who are like, "Really?" He's like, <laughs> <laughs> um, the 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 thing that continues to upset me is guns on robots. Guns on robots, really? There's no worse idea <laughs> in the whole world. Are you thinking of like the think laws of robotics kind of thing? Or like well, just they come after us? Yeah, yeah. all of the above. <laughs> <laughs> Here, look at it this way. Robots right now are really stupid, right? And so they do what we tell them. But they're stupid, so if you put a gun on it, it might shoot you. <laughs> so we make them smarter and smarter and then they get smart enough, and then they might shoot you. <laughs> it's lose-lose, except for this middle zone where they're smart enough. Zach Wiener did a Saturday morning breakfast cereal cartoon about this, where we, where he, they evolve a sentient computer. Yeah, very, yeah, exactly. I love that comment. A sentient computer evolves, and, and the, the human says, well, I guess you're going to wipe us out now. And the computer's like, well, no, why would I do that? That's awful. Or it's a robot, I suppose. And then the next, the last panel is him talking to the other robot saying, yeah, these, these are awful. We're going to have to wipe them out. <laughs> so, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much it. Plus, where do they keep all their sparing munitions? Uh, they, well, the big dog robot? follows right behind them. Yeah, <laughs> the diesel. <laughs> that thing is terrifying. That horrifying six-legged Well, I mean, I felt robot, safe yeah. as long as the Honda robot looked like it shit itself. But <laughs> as soon as big dog starts running up the hill... Have you seen the big dog video? It's and it's not so much that it's, it, the way it moves or anything. It's the noise. Uh, that humming bee noise. It's like, ah! It's like something visceral and, and primal. It's like you're being attacked by a one-ton... Three meter long, you know, bumblebees. Like, Terrible. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Terrible. there's nothing good about that sentence. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we have we have uh, about half an hour for questions. Um, I think we have people passing around microphone. Okay, we got a microphone oh, wow. over there. Um, so just raise your hand, and they will hopefully run over to you very quickly. Oh, line up. Okay. So line up. Go line up behind the wonderful microphone handler down there, and we'll do your best. Do our best to answer the questions. How's your con going, Phil? Pretty well, actually. I had a podcast this morning and while you were taking a nap. Everybody see Jamie. Uh, ja oh my god. What? Um, oh. I, was just, I was thinking about Adam and Jamie when I said that. Oh, for God's sake. Did anybody see Adam's tweet? Under the a yeah, nap, nap. in bed. That was cute. It was <laughs> totes and totes. But it was, and I thought, you know, it was like two hours ago, and it's like, oh god, this will be interesting. I actually had to, I actually had to crop out my shoulder because it looked a little too come hither in the very first <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was like, how are so, you doing? Oh, and he's geocaching it. There's a line outside <laughs> your room. Yeah. All right, so let's uh, start with the first question. Go ahead. Hey, um, so as somebody who studied evolutionary biology, uh, I have noticed that there seems to be some hostility uh, to science a lot in the political realm and just in the public in general, uh, in terms of evolution, in terms of climate science and things like that, and definitely, you know, shows that popularized science are good for that, but do you guys see other strategies for um, helping people to understand the importance of science and, uh, you know, actually realize that it's a good and important part of our lives and not something to be feared or left at. Well, is, is Senator Paul Brown in the audience? No? Okay. Yes, the local, like, local Atlantans are laughing at that. How do, you, how do you spread the message to people who may not be open to hearing it? Well, you know, <laughs> a couple of years ago, uh, Jamie and I were at the White House Press Correspondents' Dinner, which was really awesome. Uh, and this man started coming over to us to take a picture. Um, and I didn't recognize him at first because, like most people you see on television every day, he's far handsomer in person than I was prepared for. Really? It was really weird. It was Rick Santoro. Oh. And he came over and he said, I love your show. I need to take a picture with you. And I'm sort of frozen in place. <laughs> Jamie's just like sitting there like. <laughs> and he says, my 11 and 12 year old sons watch your show every day. And I thought, oh, that can't be that bad. Yeah. I'm teaching Rick Santorum's son to think critically, at least, <laughs> maybe. And, and that's, uh, I, think, I think the answer to your question is that uh, people compartmentalize a lot. So you'll have somebody who says, um, I think science is great, except for this one thing over here, which I disagree with ideologically. And whether that's 
creationism or you know vaccines or whatever you know and, and if you can if you can expose them to science i hate to use that phrase especially with the phrase come hither still floating in the air <laughs> <laughs> but if you can do that and just get them to understand the scientific method it's it, you know they can you can live your whole life believing two contradictory things but hopefully at some point if those two things meet one of them's gonna lose. But and if one of them to, is, you know, science, then the other one, which is fantasy, might might fall. Well, I mean, also, you know, as a public speaker and communicator, as both, you know, as we all three are, um, you know, I take a hard stance on it when I'm out in public. And, you know, I point out that you can't get on a plane and fly somewhere yeah. and deny climate change. The same things resulted in both. Yeah, yeah right? exactly. Like you, you just you, you have to accept the world on its merits, and that's what science is. And just it, you, we are humans, and we are explorers. And you can hold your head in the sand to deny that it's the case, but um, that's just that's stupid. Yeah, don't don't tweet me and say the Earth is six thousand years old. There's no really no greater irony. Yeah. I tweeted, if you think the Earth is 6,000 years old, please unfollow me. And I lost about 80 people in a couple of days. <laughs> With lots of this. Gladly. Bye. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Don't let the door hit you in the ass. <laughs> All right. Next question. Oh, hello there. Um, through your careers working uh, in several uh, jobs and fields, uh, you've met several people, um, some of which you enjoyed, I assume. Uh, which uh, have you enjoyed the most, or have looked forward to working with the most in your fields? That's easy. Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, here we go. Oh, wait. Now, someone give me a razor so I can shave my head. Yeah, I, I went with bifocals because I'm so old, progressives no longer work on me. Bifocals are awesome! <laughs> <laughs> I use those on Hubble. <laughs> oh, here they are. Um, that's a good question. Do you have somebody you've always wanted to work with? Well, you know, you done hundreds. Um, I was sitting across, I got interviewed by Neil Tyson, Neil deGrasse Tyson on the Star Talk. <laughs> That name's, you know, not, that name's not familiar, is he? Uh... <laughs> you know, he, I was watching him ask a question, and I was just thinking, man, this guy is, I'm just so blown away to be in the room with this guy. And he just, he totally knows what he wants to do, what his mission in life is, and it is to communicate. Mm -hmm. And it is, was that moment in which I realized, oh, right, that is actually also one of my jobs. And I am, <laughs> I am happy to follow like a duckling in his footsteps to communicate yeah. about science. And I appreciate everybody else who does. Uh, Bill Nye, the science guy. Uh, uh, Dean Kamen. You know, uh, Elon Musk, I think, is doing a lot. Oh, of the yeah. I'd love to meet him, I never have. I mean, I love the idea that he brought up Hyperloop and it got all this press and he was like, whoa, whoa, slow down, it's just an idea. And I thought, that's great. And then everybody attacked him for when he said, yeah, I want somebody else to do this. Yeah, it's like, he's been saying that all along. Right, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I, uh, Neil, Neil's a funny case. Uh, I met him when I was in grad school and he was a postdoc looking for a position and he came to my, where I was studying and to give a talk and that's what postdocs do. And it was cool because we were studying sort of the same thing and then years later, I saw him on TV and I was like, that was that guy. <laughs> you know? And it, it's just, it's funny to see where he is now, remaking Cosmos and, yeah. and all that. It's I fantastic. can't wait to see that. Yeah, I think it's going to be really interesting. Uh, and, and I'm fascinated by uh, people I know who, who are you know, scientists saying, oh, it's going to be terrible, it's going to be this and this. And it's like, you have no evidence of this. You're supposed to base your life on evidence, and all you've seen is a trailer. Give it a shot. And Let's by the see way, what's gonna happen. Ben Affleck's gonna make a fine Batman. <laughs> yeah, <it's laughs> yeah. yeah. until you see it, all right? Just relax. And I'm, I'm reading Twitter, and everybody's complaining about this, and then I found out, it's not even a goddamn Batman show movie. It's gonna be <laughs> yeah, Superman. Superman. What are you complaining about? <laughs> no, we'll, they'll get to that, I'm sure. He's <laughs> a Wonder Woman, all right. actually. So. Um, I, I also want to You should be Wonder Woman. I'm, yeah. I'm, oh my god, look at this. Welcome to the gun show. Yeah. <laughs> I, I also I want to go driving with um with the Top Gear dudes. Oh, yeah.
I, I consider Top Gear to be the sister show to Mythbusters. I would do The little sister. Oh. I just oh. laid down the gauntlet. Yeah. Wait, do you mean US or UK, though? You mean... UK. I'm sorry, is there a, UK, is there a US there version? Is. Yeah. There's, only two, there's only two Star Wars movies, and there's no US version of Top Gear. I love Top Gear so hard. Okay, next. <laughs> They're camping out. They're like lying down. Yeah. All right, uh, Adam, we recently got to watch your TED Talks that you did. That was brilliant. I loved the message and everything. I uh, wanted to know if you ever got your full-scale Falcon and what your next obsession is or what you're working on now. Um, <clears throat> no, and take your pick. Uh, <laughs> so uh, a Falcon is actually... One of the original lead falcons is going up for sale at auction um, in October, I believe. And I may make a pilgrimage to New York to go see it at the auction house. Um, no, I did get an audience with a casting off of an original falcon, one of the only ones that exists. And I took about 300 pictures of it. I could use photogrammetry to build a 3D falcon, but I'm not gonna. I'm, I, I am going to re-sculpt the thing out of Sculpey, and I'm going to sculpt it just big enough so that as it shrinks during the molding process, it'll end up the right goddamn size. <laughs> um, I am about to finish the oldest obsessive project on my workbench, which is the ZF-1 from The Fifth Element. And it was actually, I literally was just in the home stretch. I got all the paint and everything, and then I communicated with someone who had access to the real one, and they said, yeah, and the distance between those two plates is 52 millimeters. And, I, and they said it as an aside, and I said, what? <laughs> I, I know everything on this gun is totally accurate, but the distance between those plates, it's 52 mil, because mine's 59. Oh. And that's totally not okay. Wow. <laughs> so I have to fix that. And then, it's like 15% yeah. off. Or it's, it's a lot. Signif yeah. Totally unacceptable. unacceptable yeah. So um, we will do a, an unveiling, I th a pretty spectacular unveiling, I hope, on Tested in the next couple of months. Nice. That's cool. Very cool. All right, next question. Thank you. My son James is 10 years old. He's a huge fan of science, particularly Mythbusters. He's sick with a cold today. He's not able to be oh. here. But he's resting up for the show tonight. So if you see him next to me, pick him up for the any participation. <laughs> but, uh, I'm an engineer and we discuss many things, you know, pragmatically, discussing life and death. My wife and I were talking about when we die, we want to be cremated. My son said, I want to be cremated too, with flamethrowers <laughs> by Adam and Jamie. <laughs> and is the question first? is, it's a two-parter, first, is it scientifically possible to cremate a person with a hand carried flamethrower? And second, who do we contact? <laughs> well, to arrange that as well. I think Pres we just contacted him. Yeah. yeah, I also think, thanks for thinking that we'll still have a show when your son leaves this mortal coil. <laughs> Um, and I, we would be totally, yes, we could completely incinerate your son. <laughs> Another sentence I never thought I was right. <laughs> well, um, can you? I mean, bones, when they're cremated, there's like, there are rules and stuff about how you do this. I'd really like the chance to cry. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> uh, I'd also point out that if, if we're close enough, to him to talk about incinerating him, and then we incinerate him. Clearly we've talked to him just before he's died, so we would also then have to test the 21 grams myth. Oh, oh yeah. That would, be, <laughs> that would be tough, I would think. I'm sorry, I love this audience. Groaning at yeah, that is yeah, brilliant. That's, that's exactly right. Phil, yeah. would you like to explain the 21 grams myth? That is uh, that when somebody dies, they suddenly lose 21 grams, so and that is the soul. weight of their soul. Leaving. Right, and, and, and I'm thinking, is, really, because you know, you're know you breathing out, and... But it's, what's beautiful about it is, if you read the actual test, I can't remember the name of the scientist, if he built a very elaborate, well, yeah. He built a very elaborate scale with a hospital bed on it, and he weighed actually dozens of people at the moment of their death and achieved no data whatsoever, except in one case, 
there was a 21 gram discrepancy and he was like, that's the answer. Yeah. <laughs> that's... I think he was at a tuberculosis clinic. Was that it? For a, to a place where people were, were dying of the consumption. Yeah. This is the awesomest panel ever. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to keep on leading back. Yeah, I know. Every time I have a little heart attack, every time I do. Well, my goal is to be incinerated by the sun turning into a red giant, so I have plenty of time. <laughs> nice. Singularity's coming, right? So yes, totally. Okay. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Next question. They, they literally are hey. camping out. <laughs> <laughs> Next to the um, pirate eye patch myth, which is brilliant, uh, the moon hoax is my favorite. And I'm wondering if you've had any serious blowback from the idiots who don't think we ever went to the moon. Serious blowback? Do you want to you put that adjective in front of that? Because <laughs> the answer will be no. Yeah, I, I don't think anyone who was a moon landing denier was convinced by our episode. In fact, there, was, there were a fair number who use our episode as evidence that because we made some convincing frames that looked like the moon landing, yeah, right. yeah. Stanley Kubrick could have done it. <laughs> it's like, well, you, you guys weren't convinced by the hundreds of millions of dollars spent by NASA, the 400,000 people who worked on it, by the thousands of pictures returned by the astronauts, by the moon rocks that were brought back, by the engineering that you can still see. So yes, they, you know, <laughs> a 42-minute TV show will certainly sway them. You know, it's just, what are you gonna do? Were you at TAM when I was confronted yeah. by the, I was confronted yeah. on stage by a moon landing denier. He's, who, he's pestered me a few times as Who well. wanted to get some, he wanted to, he was challenging me. He was throwing the gauntlet down. And I said, okay, well, look, you, I don't know why you're talking to me because I'm a TV host, not a scientist. <laughs> um, secondly, I know that I'm right. So you're just gonna have to accept a bunch of bias on my part. Um, and third of all, when the, El, when the Las Vegas magazine that was covering that story went and interviewed him, it turned out his childhood dream was to be an astronaut. <laughs> Like, if a screenwriter wrote that, I'd be like, that's a little obvious. I might tone that one down. Yeah. He's got that NASA letter clutched in his hand with a big red stamp on it that says no. Yeah. Too short. Yeah. Awesome. I was just thinking about that because of the eight balls, right? The new, the new roster of astronauts. Yeah. And there is a height requirement. There's a height Has banner. Has there always been? Yeah, sure, but I mean, imagine being kind on of one or the other side of it and meeting all the other requirements. You'd be like, Ugh. well, b back in the Apollo days, they were scraping paint off of the capsule to make it lighter. So if somebody's an inch shorter, and plus those capsules were tiny. So when you meet a lot of these Apollo astronauts, they're not that tall. And then last year I met Mike Massimino. He's like a giant. <laughs> he was like 18 feet tall. He's this enormous guy. And he's, he's like six five maybe. And when you add to that astronaut charisma, it's like seven yeah, it's really and a half true. feet. Yeah. He's a big guy. That was kind of shocking. Yeah. You know, it, it's funny because uh, uh, if you've ever studied improv, there's a concept in improv of status, that everyone has a natural status. And most drama is created by status changing within the course of a scene. And it's a fascinating lens to go look at the world. Because I work with cops all the time, and it's fascinating to watch a cop try to ask me for an autograph. Because <laughs> cops are taught to have the highest status in the room. It's how they maintain control, and they're good at it. Some of them don't know how to turn it off. And when they want to ask me for an autograph, it's funny to watch their body kind of go through this sort of thing. And so I started, I watched my ear surgeon, this guy who operated on my ear, had a much higher status than any cop I've ever met. And then you and I had dinner with Ed Liu, and I was like, an astronaut. There it is, that's the highest status I've ever met. Because he's like, I've been to fucking space. Yeah. <laughs> Six months on the space station earns you some cred with us. Yeah. Okay, next question, please. Sorry for cursing if there's any children out there. Earmuffs. Just remember, it's cool when adults curse. It's disgusting when children do. <laughs> Go ahead. Have you ever used the uh, Raspberry Pi for projects on the show or in hobbies at home? And if so, do you have any projects in the future you plan on using it for? Um, you, you know... That? Raspberry Pi, we haven't. Um, I actually, I've been working on uh, Hellboy's Mecha Glove from the Hellboy film. And as, as one does. As one does, and it will be fully Arduino powered. Um, yeah, uh, and, and we- Can I be up on tested? Yes, totally. And we have talked about bringing Arduino into some experiments. It hasn't 
been needed yet, but it is on our radar. Uh, and the, the ease with which both of those platforms can be utilized to do really non-standard and awesome stuff is totally in our, in our sights and very likely will end up on the show. I'm, I'm so surprised that hasn't come up with any of the, the robots that Grant has worked on. Yeah, I, yeah, it's, it's, one of the problems is, is that you, I'm not going to learn C programming fast enough to do that on the show, so we're going to need to bring someone in to do that, and oftentimes we are looking for the fastest, so, 50 hands go up. Right? <laughs> I, I'm sure there's like five 12 year old girls within a mile of the Mythbusters shop who could do it. Um, you know, and we, we will when it comes time. We're just often under great restrictions of time and concision and think of simpler solutions. You can also use uh, Python. Program. Yes, exactly. Oh, okay. You don't have to use C. <laughs> yeah, copy that. If you need Fortran, yeah. <laughs> and Pascal, I know Pascal. I was hoping to resuscitate Fourth. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Raspberry Pi is very cool. Okay. <laughs> We're doing programming language jokes. I got well, uh... right. the Lord's Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> if I draw a square. Hi, um, have you, uh, Adam, have you ever had one of those days where you're working with a tested crew like um, Will? And you've had like one of those poignant moments where your mind's just blown by something they taught you. I'm finally which? What have you learned from? What has blown your mind that you've learned from like Will or Norm at Tested? Oh man, um, those guys are so great. They they are seemingly imperturbable as I bounce around my shop, tipping things over and banging into things and trying to figure out what to talk about. They are infinitely patient with me and. Uh, they they managed to cut these long, peripatetic, exhausting podcasts into things that sound smart and educational. Um, I love working with them. Uh, hi, Norm. Uh, Did you disappear? And, and Will is up at PAX this weekend. Uh, you know, we're still at the beginning of this relationship. It's about a year and a half in, and I'm just finding it incredibly fruitful. You know, we, we always thought of Tested uh, as being kind of an incubator for ideas about the way we want to you know, something we wanted to see on the web that wasn't actually out there. And it has really proved to be that. And uh, every bit that you like about Tested, those guys share equally in, in making it awesome. Uh, Joey Finelli also, uh, the cameraman, uh, is just wonderfully sensitive cutter, editor, uh, and, and cameraman. It's just, I love working with those guys. What are you doing, Phil? Nothing. <laughs> Selfie from the stage. By the way, I had a whole Spinal Tap moment as we were trying to get here. I ended up back there, and we're like, how are we going to get to oh, that you stage? Were there. Yeah, I, I thought was you were back there. Oh, no, 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 I was up there. Oh, my God, you were in a quantum state. So I just kept on going, rock and roll! <laughs> Hello, Atlanta! <laughs> we were worried you were still asleep. No. <laughs> it's like somebody, somebody woke up at him, right? Yeah. <laughs> All right, next question. Got a oh, or what does it say? I can't see. I went to Dragon Con once. It was awful. It's uh. Oh, it's Grumpy it's, Cat. Uh, it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I love Grumpy Cat. It's my, it's my screen. I'll show you. Go ahead. Keep talking. <laughs> awesome. Um, my question is for Veronica. I was wondering, what do you hope you live to see, but you don't think it'll happen until you're like 90, 100, 110? Asking her because she's way younger but, than we are. Aww. <laughs> Clearly, you're asking her because she's going to live so much longer than we will. Yeah. I am a lady, so statistically, um, that's a really good question. I, I I'm really, I, I've always heard that the uh, person living today will be like the, you know, the longest lived person of all time. So that's exciting. Um, but self-driving cars, I'm kind of excited about, but also really nervous about. I know they'll probably happen within the next. I would say. 30 years, they'd probably be. I'm banking on 15. 15? Yeah. Okay. Just imagine a traffic free um, downtown with I'm, everything moving so I'm nice. very excited about Hyperloop. <laughs> that would be awesome. <laughs> Basically, I travel a lot and I want to get places faster and easier. So that's kind of my, my MO for, for technology at this point. I Thank you. Say. I feel like that wasn't a good enough answer. Like, I needed to think bigger. What are you, what are you guys um, understanding about? the placebo effect to unlock the secrets of the brain to cure all sickness without drugs. Yeah. <laughs> But I like sure. <laughs> yeah. You know, I'm gonna 
throw the gauntlet down too about flying cars. Where's my flying cars? You know what? Screw your flying cars. Do any of you drive? Do you see what maniacs are on the road? Do you want them in three dimensions? Yeah. No! No Z dimension for you. <laughs> so, you know, people say, if you had a time machine, what would you do? And it's like, well, I'd wait until somebody invents the flying car and I'd go back in time and kill them before they were born. <laughs> Or I would go back in time and kill my father before I was born to prevent there being a time travel paradox from my using the time machine. Um, <laughs> oh, replicator. Yeah. I've always wanted a replicator. replicator. And I like how that's sort of waving through the crowd right now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I have always wanted a replicator. I think that's my big one. And I'm hoping 3D printing is just the beginning. Yes. I, yeah. Totally. I, I really want to say T, Earl Grey. Earl Grey. Oh. Hot. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Why does he need to say hot? He doesn't want iced tea. <laughs> Can't he just say the usual after like the 40th episode? Yeah. And I would think his computer is an idiot. <laughs> I think if he wanted iced tea, that's what Whoopi would be serving. Yeah. And like, I get with one bourbon. person who thought that joke was yeah. funny. <laughs> and with replicators, I mean, that's you're, you're converting matter. You're basically, you're, it's alchemy. And, and the amount of energies involved would actually vaporize the planet. So I'm actually kind of hoping we don't have replicators. <laughs> I Stop know. Ruining my life. Science sucks. <laughs> I would like one half Jeff Goldblum, one half Fly. <laughs> what could go wrong? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> All right. We still have time for about another ten minutes or so. So next question. Go oh ahead. my God, my kids haven't seen the Fly. I've got to write that down. <laughs> You know, yeah, I, I just showed them Leon the Professional last week, and they think I'm like the greatest dad ever. I'm actually. I've been showing my daughter movies from the '80s. And, and we watched The Fly, and, I, and she was pretty freaked out by it, as you might expect. Yeah. But um, I'm finding a lot of these movies hold up. This has nothing to do with anything. I'm just going to chat with Adam here for a minute. <laughs> and, um, the Thing? You know, the Thing. Oh, I love that. It's my favorite horror movie. Oh, my God. Um, we still have questions. Please. Oh, yeah, we still have questions. Oh. Stop ruining people's lives. All right. All right. Go ahead. Pause oh, button. <laughs> Hi, I'm a scientist, and I actually went to high school with Adam. Oh. Sleepy Hollow. And at the Wait, time... Wait, who is that? Uh, and she'd like to introduce you to your Gretchen. son. What's that? Gretchen Meller. Oh. Uh, Mike Meller's little sister. Hi, Gretchen. <laughs> wow. Um, and, sorry, that wasn't the point. The I, remember point watching, is... I remember watching your brother Michael sword fighting on your front lawn when I was a little kid, and it still holds in my head of like, God, I wish I could do that. <laughs> I remember you were really into drama, with like, like my brother was, and as a scientist, I now run a science cafe where I get scientists to come speak to the general public in a pub or someplace informal. Scientists really enjoy this. Some are very good speakers, some not so much. And, and I'm just wondering if you have any advice for what to suggest to them. Sometimes I say pretend like you're speaking to your family about what you do. But I'm just wondering as a drama person, as somebody coming from an acting background, what you would bring for more good discussion in science. That is a great question. That is a fantastic yeah, really question. question. Um, I've always held two axioms in my head in public speaking. Um, by the way, Gretchen, after this, please come backstage. I'd like to say hi. Um, so, <laughs> guys, that's all right. Uh, I I remember two things. One, time moves faster on stage, and so the pause that you think and start panicking about is actually much shorter for the people in the audience than it is for you. And that when you are relaxed, uh, the, your audience will be relaxed. And you don't have to be relaxed to appear re relaxed. You just when have you ever been relaxed? Well, I just, I just mean comfortable. Com so you okay. can slow down your cadence and you can, you can you know, try and breathe on stage. And I've, I've just noticed a direct correlation between the degree to which I am chill and the audience is entertained. And you know, people get you get caught up when you can't think of a word, and the audience is there, and the pressure is on, and it's it's real. 
but you can also just keep remembering what your point is and remembering. The more relaxed I am, the more relaxed they'll be. It's a, it's a, it's the right side of a feedback loop. I've also kind of had this experience a lot doing factor fictional because we interview a lot of brilliant, brilliant people that don't have a lot of on-camera experience. And the thing that I usually tell them is not to underestimate the audience. Like they're, they're geeks. They're passionate about this stuff too. Like don't feel like you have to dumb down the conversation, and then you won't get caught up kind of garbling your words, trying to make it easier for them to understand. Just talk about what you know and have a conversation. It's really about having a conversation with the audience, not speaking at them. Yes. Uh, um, I would say too, um, not every scientist should maybe be in front of a camera. <laughs> just like just like not every science communicator is necessarily going to be a great scientist. You know, I mean, people have their strengths and weaknesses. Wait, what? Um, <laughs> um, no, I, I, I'm sorry, I was thinking of me, actually. Um, I, sorry, Adam, I didn't mean no, to I apply you at all. Um, but uh, honestly, uh, what I try to tell people when they ask me that question or something like it is I say, just remember why you love this. You know, you're, you, you've devoted your life to doing this. So there's a reason for that. There's a passion in there. Whether, whether, whether that passion <laughs> comes out as just a, a devotion to it or whether it comes out you know, like, like us, <laughs> like that, um, there's, there's a reason it's there. There's a reason you love it. So remember that when you're talking about it. I'll make another technical note, which is humans are storytellers. And we like stories. We like the things we say to have a narrative arc, so a beginning, a middle, and an end. And oftentimes when you're speaking in front of people, you might feel as you're reaching the end of your statement, like, oh my God, the end is coming and I don't feel like it's a good ending. And the natural human response I've noticed is to then repeat the thing you just said one or two more times in its entirety. <laughs> if you watch, you'll notice Gosh, that's that you- true. That's really true. true. Yeah, <laughs> no. Crap. And the real, <laughs> like, I have taught myself if I feel like that's happening, just stop talking. <laughs> just, boop, I just, just go, and then I'm done. Yeah, and that's my little talk. And stop. <laughs> like I did just now. All right, we have time for maybe one and one and a half questions left. Go ahead. Uh, hello again. I saw you a couple of years ago. You're lots of fun, Adam. Thank you again for coming. And you too, Phil. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. I love your blog. Um, so, uh, a quick point and then a question. Um, on the moon landing, there was a video about the technological limitations of actually recording and maintaining the video of the moon landings, which is substantially, like, for such a short, simple point, it gets, like, it's not even actually possible to have faked the moon landing, let alone, you know, it would be easier just to go there, kind of thing. So <laughs> definitely check that out. Okay. Um, we do have a second moon landing episode that we'd love to do. We're just not sure we're going to do it. Uh, you know, it's, it's like it, it's something we've talked about for years. Keep me in mind. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Buddy, <laughs> don't worry. So actual question. Um, I'm 27 years old and I don't know what the hell I'm doing with my life. And I feel like there are a lot of people here in the same boat. Yeah. Um, it's partly a lot of trepidation. I mean, we all grew up saying go to college, get the degree. Suddenly we're in a yeah. crappy economy and we want to do more. Right. We're, but we're trepidatious. There's so much fear about being, not even being successful, but just being able to live off of doing something you enjoy. Um, like, I wanna be a scientist, I wanna get into that, but going through school is horrifying. <laughs> it's and just a 13 terrible years idea in this country. Yeah. Um, give me your, like, what would you, a scientist that's a big, and an actor. That's a big question Yeah. the last question. I'm gonna make a stump here. I was hanging out with Mike Rowe last week, and we were talking about this. It's yeah, amazing. Yes. <laughs> I love Mike Rowe. I brought him. I actually brought him to a dinner party where I think half of the dinner party was like, "Well, I guess this is what it's like to hang out with someone from Discovery." They just bring all the other hosts. <laughs> um, but uh, in this economy, I will point out that there are a lot of fantastic jobs out there for welders, hydraulic engineers. Uh, machinists and we have raised a generation on follow your dreams to a degree that I think has done a disservice to younger people because you need to work your ass off yeah. and there's nobody who's not successful that didn't work their ass to the bone to get where they're to get where they are and there is 
real service and honor in working hard and doing something you are proud of. And there's a real art to all of these practices. And the starting salaries are fantastic. Uh, Caterpillar is calling the technical schools in Las Vegas and around the Midwest every single day looking for new graduates to start at sixty dollars to $80,000 a year. Yeah. Hello? I know. Yeah, I'm not um, <laughs> you know, but coming from me, so I felt like I wasted too many years telling people like, oh, I followed my dreams. No, actually, I did, but I also worked really, really yeah. hard. Yeah. Uh, and <laughs> there's plenty of time to figure out what you want to do. That's the other thing that I would have told my 16-year-old self. You have more time than you think. You know, I'm still not sure what I'm going to be when I grow up. <laughs> I mean, really, you know, at some point, Mythbush is going to reach the other end of its bell curve, and what I do after that, I'm not sure. I'm trying everything. Yeah, actually, that's pretty much what I would have said. Um, I delivered a lot of pizzas in grad school, and I've worked a lot of crap jobs. I think everybody has. You have to. And it's not like something's going to necessarily fall in your lap. And, and you, can get, you can get a very biased view of success, especially in the geek community, because the people you see who are successful you know, tend to be, you know, the Felicia Days and the Will Wheatons, and, and you don't necessarily see really how hard they've been working for a really long time. Well, they're, and their narrative they looks like a really, it looks like an inevitable one, but it's far yeah. from it. Yeah, and I, people, sometimes people say, hey, how can I be a successful blogger? And I tell them, build a time machine and go back to 1998, because that's far easier than starting now um, and, and trying to do it. Uh, you, you, have to, you have to put your nose to the grindstone. I like this idea that you were saying of, of the welders and all that. That's, that's true. And the other part is that with the web, there's a lot more opportunity, but it depends on what you're doing. You know, if you're a writer or you're, you're, you're somebody who makes video in some way, hosting a show or whatever, there's a lot more venues out there than there used to be when I was a kid. There were three channels. Uh, so that's great, but if, you're, if that's not your thing, what are you going to do? And, and your point of... of um, follow your dream being a disservice is exactly right because you have this sort of backwards looking it's like oh if i just i'm an american if i just try this everything i've seen in the movies eventually i'll succeed and it doesn't work that way no and you know frankly school lots of school might seem like a horrifying option unless you found the field that you can't believe isn't being explored to the degree you're interested in it and that's where you want to go and at that point you will bust your ass, but that will be the, the place you'll be wanting right. to commit. All right, well, that was a very, that was an excellent last, last question, for sure. That, was, that wow. was awesome. Do you guys have anything you want to pitch before we have to go? I, Any I more just want to say, I can't believe we're being talked to up here by the amazing Veronica Belmont. Woo! Yes, sweet. We've never shared a stage before, and it's yeah, awesome. Yes, it was a lot of fun. Thank you. Absolutely. So where, where else are you guys going to be at DragonCon? Uh, Jamie and I have a panel tomorrow. Uh, it's Jamie's first Dragon Con. Go easy. I think I did, a, I did a panel three years ago where I said, Jamie's not coming to Dragon Con. I was wrong. <laughs> uh, I, I've got, I don't know, it's on the back of my, I got all kinds of stuff I, going on, but um, just, oh, look, and, just uh, look around. We got I'm going to be doing the, the, the we're doing the, the, the Gonzo show on Sunday night, oh, and Gonzaru tomorrow, and I'm gonna do Adam Incognito. I've got a yeah. costume in my hotel room. Yes. It's, there's, there's, a Chewbacca. Chewbacca. there's a Chewbacca right outside, and I'm like, that might be Adam. No, no. no. <laughs> I did. Che I don't repeat. Yeah. Yeah. I did Chewbacca before. I was Chewbacca before. <laughs> 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 